What's good, folks, and welcome to the Red Wedding edition of the Cover One Film Room, appropriately named and titled by my co-host, as always, on this show, Mr. Eric Turner. Yeah. I am Anthony Prohasco. Welcome to an episode that Eric and I did not have planned. We have been, you know, a little peek behind the curtains. We like to do from time to time. We have this awesome episode coming for you. That'll still be coming because it's still it relevant. We have this awesome episode coming with wide receiver comps and breakdowns of wide receiver prospects coming out of the draft, who their NFL comps are stylistically from a yards after catch perspective, from a separation perspective with film and metrics and measurements and all the things that you have come to know and love and appreciate about this show. And we've been working on it for about over two weeks, two weeks. <laughs> and in the span of three or four hours today, it all went out the window. Yeah. We've had to pivot completely. We at first were like, you know what? Let's, Let's do a little segment in the beginning about yeah. some of the stuff. And yeah. then more things just kept coming and coming. And Eric, here we are in uh kind of you know uncharted waters a little bit, just with the amount of moves that came for the from the Bills today, the significance of them, the players involved. You had a great point before we went live of the amount of moves, but also the emotion that is tied here right. because of the players that are going, all of these things. Where's your head at? Is it still spinning? How do you feel after we've been scrambling for the last couple hours in this pivot? Honestly, this pivot, this show may be one of the most in-depth shows that we get into, but one that is also going to probably have information coming in as we go live, but at the very same time, the least prepared that we are because of the lack of details on some of the moves and contracts and what does it all mean uh, on top of how we're going to cover some of those moves when we're talking some of the changes on the offensive line. So there's a lot to unpack here. Thankfully we have a couple hours to do it before Greg and Aaron go live at 9 PM. Um, obviously they're going to have Greg. He's one of our cap gurus as, as is Anthony. Uh, they're going to have a, a big overview on some of those numbers and I'm sure it'll settle in a little more by then. Uh, but tonight, as Anthony said, we had to pivot two and a half hours ago completely from the show that we've been prepping for, for a couple hours. Uh, just because of the uh, the flurry of moves uh, by Brandon Bean and the Bills. And uh, as you said, we're calling this the Red mm -hmm. Wedding Film Room uh, episode. So great by um, you. That might be one of the greatest things you've ever done. Like, ever, forget the film. <laughs> forget starting cover one. It was just so perfect. Like, that's one of the best things you've ever done. It just rolled off the tongue, man. It made too much sense because, as you said, the emotions um, that were tied to some of the players that were released today when you're talking Jordan Poyer, Trey White, um, you know, Mitch Morse, like our guys trading away Ryan Bates. Again, another one of our guys that we've had here in the film room, um, foundational pieces, culture changer uh, type players uh, early on in this regime. And so, you know, it's one of those days where uh, it's sad, it's emotional, but in the end, we're going to show you why, you know, some they made some of these moves, not just from a financial standpoint, but from the next phase that they're in with some of these contracts, your quarterback contracts, some of the other contracts that being is handled out and how that, you know, kind of trickled down the roster. Mm -hmm. And as you'll see, it it's definitely taken a toll on this roster. And so a lot of these drastic moves, some that were not even really predicted, had to be made today. Yeah, the you know, I we talked about it a little on the show. I've talked about on disguise coverage, like the potential of Jordan Poyer going, but I didn't really think it would happen. Like the Naheem right. Hines move that happened. I, okay. Makes sense. Deontay Hardy. Hardy. Okay, cool. Mm -hmm. Makes sense. Trey white. I guess it kind of makes sense, but I did not think that that was going to happen. The Mitch Morse move. I did not think that was going to happen, especially after they that traded Ryan Bates. No, like, and, and, and all of it. Yeah. Just coming in rapid fire succession one after the other after the other like it was i think that was also what got me too it wasn't just the the moves themselves but just how they came like one after the other which really is interesting and again it doesn't necessarily maybe i'm reading too much into it but from a kind of like getting your ducks in a row perspective by brandon bean this is all very like calculated and purposeful as everything always is but just how it all lined up it really is very red wedding-esque just with yeah. how it all went down and we're sitting here, you know, like everything just, oh, I see the tweets here. Yeah. The, the, the gifts of us is trying to like scramble and everything going on. And yeah, Aaron uh, has a nice comment there too, about uh, Von Miller who straight up today, like in case folks don't know, like he straight up took a pay cut. Yes. 
he has the opportunity mm-hmm. to earn back what he, you know, cut and actually potentially more um, via incentives. But all of that is incentives. It's not guaranteed. So he straight up took a pay cut today. Um, yeah, he, he did, man. Yeah, and like that. let's start there, Ant. Like, let's start there because obviously coming back from the injury last year, he was not on his game. Now he did show flashes at the end of last season. Yeah. kind of showed some of that, you know, snap timing, some of that burst off the line of scrimmage. But this was, I mean... Uh, a straight pay cut was not expected, right? No. Like, I mean, who, even the most, I don't know, like the, the most altruistic of players aren't about like, yeah, cool, I'll take a pay cut. Like, players don't do that really in sports in general, but especially in football where like your shelf life is not guaranteed. It's a risky sport. Every single play that you are out there, it's a risk to your long-term health and your career. So you don't really see pay cuts like that. And Vaughn taking one again in a significant amount, his base salary for this year was about 17 million and oh, nice. There's a tweet there. Yeah. Gotcha. Um, about 17 million. What he ended up doing is reported by either uh field gates initially. And then I think Ian Rappaport followed it up. He reduced his base salary down to a million and then ended up taking a $7 million signing bonus for a total of like eight, eight, eight and a half million base mm-hmm. um, for this season. But that basically freed up about $8 million in cap space for the Bills this year, which added with all the moves from earlier before the Von Miller move, cleared up about roughly $45 million for the Buffalo Bills today, which is absolutely wild. Again, it does come with, you know, pulling on the heartstrings a little bit. But just, yeah, what a what a place to start for us here with a contract and a player that every re- everyone's really been raking over the coals a bit because of him not coming back in ways that they wanted or potentially expected. And now he did a move, you know, that again, he still has the opportunity to make more, but this was really a team-friendly move that he did today. Yeah, and honestly, even before that, if you're talking defensive line, if you're talking edge, um, we mapped out what the roster kind of looked like, um, you know, a few days ago. And then I just had to tweak it before uh, the show, but it, we, we thought that, you know, a DN was needed in free agency or the draft. We've looked yeah. at a bunch of them in free agency. We've obviously uh, looked towards the draft as well. And, and so I don't think that changes much in, in that way, but it does, as you said, free up some money. The bills overall did free up a bunch of that today. And, and we talked about how being made us, you know, a lot more work today. He, he gave us a lot more work to do before this show today, but not just for this show, but yeah. we're talking now that money, they kind of freed up. Now some of those positions, as you see in red there, where you're talking starters, you're talking important depth and rotational players. They opened up a little more money. So that obviously made some more work for us when we're targeting free agents, because maybe it opens up a different player or a different uh, cluster of uh, free agent tier. Um, but it also opens up different positions in the draft. There's a lot of red on the screen now, Anthony, and it wasn't <laughs> all there. Most of it was, you know, it, those rotational pieces, those depth pieces, a couple starters here and there. But, man, there was a lot of holes made today based on these moves. Absolutely. And even just to kind of give one example that really puts kind of things into perspective here, you know, Jeremy Chin has been a name that's been talked about with the Bills a bunch. And you and I both went into, uh, yeah. you know, some of the red flags with him um, from a, uh, you know, individual player evaluation perspective. But one of the issues that we had as well was like potential redundancy with Jordan Poyer. Mm-hmm. Now that's out the window because yeah. Poyer's gone. But also that means you now need, you basically need two starting safeties. Yeah. Hamlin's, a, it, Hamlin's day basically a, just a holding yeah. piece right there. That's it. Yeah, <laughs> we're know? just trying to have like a name in the, like the starting <laughs> spot right there. But yeah. you effectively need two starters. You can go in a lot of ways, but also it's tough to have two new starting safeties, especially in this system, which is yeah. one of the things we talked about, about why we wanted Jordan Poyer to stay. So now you really do need to get like a strong vet in free agency who is schematically sound to kind of help with that transition. And also Trey white is out from that, like secondary, yeah. like all these guys who have been these linchpins for the secondary and all this, like these cascading effects and impacts everything that's gone on. And it just, like you said, you know, it, it shifts that focus. Now, instead of going, you know what, we got Poyer, let's look and see if you can get, you know, an Alohi Gilman or a Brandon Jones or oh, a safety yeah. at the back end, you know, maybe on day three to pair and develop with that free agent. You kind of go from there. Now you're talking about you need two legitimate starters at safety on top of all the work you needed on defensive line. And even the wide receiver piece, that's a little. 
I know Deontay Hardy wasn't in everyone's plans. That's another hole you kind of need to fill as well. In addition to the one, Eric, that you got queued up on the screen right now, Tredavious White, who at worst this upcoming season, maybe not at worst, but you're thinking probably is like corner three, but I thought he was going to factor into the rotation, like potentially yeah. even being ready for the start of the season. I know he had some, you know, his mentals weren't there coming back from the ACL initially. So maybe that delayed his timeline here, but I was okay. Even though it's an expensive corner three, I like the idea of having Benford and Rasul Douglas and Trey white. And now your corner three is Kyrie Elam. How much faith do you have in Kyrie Elam? Like, are you looking at corner three somewhere? Like what just, it so creates so many more questions, questions in a whole, man. Yeah. I mean, it's, uh, I said it, you know, before we went live, the, the secondary is completely being made over. We also right? just, just broke huge... this news to Jared here. He said, oh, I hadn't seen the Trey news. <laughs> so somebody in the chat just found out about Trey right Breaking now. news uh, from two hours ago. Yeah, <laughs> it, it's, again, that one's emotional because he yes. was a, a foundational piece. He's someone that the Bills um, invested in uh, the player and the human. He was kind of that, essentially that first draft pick of this regime. Um, and Trey made them right. You know, he, he, he was a, such a good technician, um, a light, you know, a lighter mood and in, in uh, the locker room and off the field, but he, he became one of the best corners in the league under Sean McDermott and Leslie Frazier in Buffalo. Unfortunately, the last couple of years he's been, uh, injured and, and these are, you know, pretty damaging injuries to, um, mm -hmm. a skill position like corner. Uh, so it was going to be an uphill battle, but this one was a very emotional one. I think most of us were had it on the back burner, maybe not in the forefront, but had it in the, on the back burner in the back of our heads uh, that this could happen. Um, but if you think about Trey White not being there, mm. Poyer being released today, another foundational guy, another guy that grew up in the system, a guy that was, and you saw even more so last year than even prior, is how important his ability to communicate and get everyone on the same page mm -hmm. when he was playing at safety, when he was playing at dimebacker at the second level. Like he showed even, you know, how much of a, uh, um, leader he was in, in that regard he's not going to be there Hyde's gone like it's a huge overhaul I mean John Butler we talked about him a few weeks yeah, ago yeah good call adding Jamila Dye and how that could change their philosophy and uh, some of these moves again with free agency and the draft up ahead and as you talked about some of the the depth being kind of shaky uh, not only on the outside but now behind Taron Johnson because they don't really have that Saran Neal or that Cam Lewis to, to flex in there. Um, obviously, they can still make some moves there, but there's a lot in flux there in that secondary, and uh, it's almost turning the page, moving on to that next phase, redistributing that money that was in the secondary. But it did hurt because these were guys that were you know, cornerstones of this defense. They really stood for what this regime instilled, and so it's, uh, it's on to a new phase, but for us, you know, we're going to try to bridge the gap schematically, not just the financial moves and, and what it means cap wise. We're going to try to kind of bridge that gap between uh, what it means going forward for this defense schematically and for their roster going forward. Yeah. And that's, that's such the heat. Like that's what is so important going forward. Like today, I think the initial thought is the emotion and then also like the financial aspect of it as well. Like, Oh, what does this mean for like you, like we were talking about earlier and talking about offline, like, what kind of tier does this potentially open up for some free agent additions? Like what type of possibilities are now on the horizon? But mm -hmm. once that kind of reactionary thought process starts to settle a little bit, you get into that spot of, okay, what is this team going to look like on the field? Even if you replace them with players that you do like, and I'm like for, I don't know, whoever out there really loves Jeremy Chin or if somebody out there really thinks, you know, Hey, they can go and get Antoine Winfield jr. Now, whatever the hell, like, or anybody on defensive line, if Jones comes back, if it's Rankins, if they go out and draft the defensive end or whatever they do, the schematic impact now for this defense is significant. And for, you know, those playing at home, red is not great in terms of uh, the graphic that we have here. And you look at all the red that exists on the Bills ledger, and you legitimately need a defensive tackle starter opposite of Ed Oliver. Speaking that of, has not changed. Um, nope. there, has, there are no, there's been no communication so far in regards to that starting nose tackle position right now, um, that's on the line. Um, so we, again, I do think like whether it's right away going into the legal tampering period or even the first or second wave of free agency, I do think 
that the Bills would benefit from bringing Daquan Jones back. I think that would Absolutely. obviously free up a need, but I do think given his position, given his um, playing time and injury last year, I do think he still got a lot left. And we saw him have broken down in several film rooms how important he was not just to the Bills defense, but to Ed Oliver and some of those starters like Terrell Bernard and Matt Milano at that second level. So hopefully, you know, they are able to bring Daquan back. They obviously have a decent amount of money and the, the nose tackle market, it kind of reminds me of that safety market, which is why I do think yes. that the bills will be able to get at least one starter out of free agency mm. from the safety market. And hopefully it's some of the guys that we broke down. Cause we put a lot of time into those safeties. Absolutely. <laughs> I, I really think the, before Poyer was released, I really thought the possibility of Alohi Gilman or Brandon Jones oh to the Bills were like strong moves, just from a schematic fit, the cost, um, the style of play, all that kind of stuff. Like I thought that was a real possibility. I still think that you can, again, you can get multiple safeties coming on here. And if you want to go the double that route, cool. Maybe you go with Alohi Gilman and Mike Edwards or Jeremy Chin and Mike Edwards or some guy or, you know, Chin and, and Gilman or some kind of combination. I think you have the opportunity to get multiple safeties um, coming out of there. You know, Ashton Davis is another one who I, I, I liked him a lot at Cal with how fast yeah, he, he was. was fun. Man. Yeah, he was fun, especially if we're talking the schematic changes that could happen as soon yes. as they brought on Jamila Dye and John Butler left. It was kind of like, hey, are they shifting to more man coverage? May mm -hmm. they play a little more single high safety looks? Then they go ahead and release Poyer. They don't have Hyde. Do I mean, are they trying to remake that secondary that that you know to get more of a, a rangy mm -hmm. post safety that single high uh, safety look that has those uh, you know those guys that can really cover some ground? Ashton Davis is that guy, um, an incredible athlete. Um, there's veterans out there like Mike Edward, just a you know a guy that has a nose for the ball always. Yeah around the ball, always making plays in all levels of the and game. And a championship pedigree, Super and Bowl with Tampa 100%. Bay, Super Bowl with Kansas City. And the Bills loved him when he was coming out. I, I sat there at the Senior Bowl and watched one of their reps sit down and do an interview in the lobby for over an hour with Edwards. Oh, so wow. there are the, the safety market is, there's some really good players, and their, mm -hmm. their contracts aren't going to be crazy. And there are a lot of guys, again, that can fit the Bills scheme, depending – on what way they want to go. And, and there's even one that's on the market right now, Cameron Curl, who's also oh, that's right. a, a legit starting safety who fits the Bills too high type scheme. Mm -hmm. But again, who knows where they're going, what direction they're going in under Babich and, and McDermott next year. Yeah, and that's part of the conversation that's fun. And also, just in case those of you watching here live don't know, um, you know what Eric has pulled up here, we've got breakdowns on tons of free agent potential options for the Buffalo Bills at positions of need all on that cover one website that we have there. Um, you're going to get film breakdowns. You're going to get contract and salary cap analysis tied to that, what their, you know, potential contract will look like average annual value total, uh, mm -hmm. what their strengths are as players. So a full scouting report, full breakdown. And again, all of that coming with film as well as Eric opens up the Jeremy chin piece there. You see that, you know, we have the stats, some of the signature pieces, contract projection and overall take, you know, from uh, the cover one aspect as a whole. And then a summary in terms of what he is as a player, his signature skill and trait. And then that film clip below, and you get that a lot um, from a variety of players that we've done a ton of work on yeah. <laughs> um, these past several weeks. Once the off season really started and Eric put that link in the chat there for that one pass piece for us here. Um, but yeah, that, that was the conversation around safety. And like you said, you can find similar value at that defensive tackle spot. Like we talked about, you know, several weeks ago when we, when we kind of looked at our and did our free agent whistle lists of, mm -hmm. you know, maybe it is an Sean Robinson. Maybe it is a Malcolm Roach. Maybe it's as simple as bringing back Daquan Jones, some aspect like that. But now you look, and when you had that graphic up, Eric, if you want to pull it up real quick again, yeah. like all the red that exists on that defensive side of the ball, you need those two safeties. Mm -hmm. You also need probably three safeties because you need another backup one. Right now, the only safeties on the roster are Damar Hamlin and Kendall Williamson. So basically, you need three safeties, two of them being starters. You mm -hmm. need at best, if you think Kyrie Elam is corner three, cool. You need a corner four. You need a nickel behind Taron Johnson now that Saran yeah. Neal is gone, who you know has kind of been that de facto nickel behind Taron. And then looking at all the red on the defensive line, you need that starter opposite Ed Oliver. But we know how much the Bills – 
And everyone in the NFL likes to rotate their defensive right. line. Now I want to get ahead of that before someone jumps in and is like, I hate all the bills rotate. <laughs> everyone does that. That's how football works now, even at the college game, but all those red spots on the defensive line at defensive end or and uh, defensive tackle and the two nose tackle spots there. Cause you know, maybe Cameron Klein plays, maybe Leonku plays, but right. also potentially not like we have them in there cause they're on the roster and they fit the mm-hmm. body spot, but mm-hmm. we easily could have left those spots blank. Those four red spots for the defensive line, even though they're, you know, three are at the backup spot and one is a starter spot, all four of them are going to see meaningful snaps. So now you need four meaningful snap generators on the defensive line, two starting safeties. That's six positions of need and roster spots of need right there before you even get into the backup corners and nickels and safeties and all that. And again, that's without considering some offensive line depth that you want to look at now, some wide receiver things, some running back things, as we also have red on the other side of the board. It's this, it's just so funny. Yeah. You nailed it. Like how much work this is now created for us going forward. And, <laughs> and it's all because of Eric, like we talked about going forward, you could, you could cut Jordan Poyer and save, you know, that 5.5 million. You could cut Deontay Hardy and save 4.2 million but then by doing that, you open up these holes that have to be filled, and that's what the Bills have done. And the Bills already had some holes that had to be filled and some spots to upgrade, specifically along that defensive line and a starter opposite of Jordan Poyer. Now that that's just been intensified by removing Poyer, removing Hardy, removing Mitch Morris and Ryan Bates, which means now maybe you need to take a look at offensive line depth a little more seriously in free agency or the draft. It's, who man, just a, it's just a ton of things. Yeah, it's still like like – my mind is still in a can't wrap your head around it. Yeah, no, no, I can't. I'm still spinning. (laughs) I, the moment says draft a DT in round one and another one later on. And I bring this up because it's, it really kind of, and we talked about it prior to going live. I go, you know, before all of these moves, obviously nose tackle and D tackle all together were a huge need for us. Pretty, pretty much right up there. One or two, as far as needs going into free agency and the draft. And, you know, I do think the Bills will address it in free agency, being typically likes to lock up a lot of those positions, going to the draft uh, as uh, worry-free as possible. But with all this red on that left side on defense, guys, I feel like the probability of going wide receiver in round one mm-hmm, mm-hmm. has dropped a little bit. And I know that is not what you guys want to hear. Everyone's just like, boo. We're trying to prepare you for what may happen. Again, free agency is ahead. And the good news is, being did free up some money, but he yes. also created a bunch of holes, as you guys can see. So there are a lot more needs now, and we're talking dire needs uh, in, in many ways that they do need. But I, I like the positive about this. I do like how they are redistributing that money. And mm. yes, those those red spots, those safety spots you talked about, some of those rotational D spots, D tackle spots. I do think that there are some players that we've outlined over the last few weeks that could fill that for modest contracts Mm -hmm. and at positions that aren't typically all that expensive. And then uh, obviously we'll get to the offense here in a little bit. Cause honestly on that side of the ball, the shakes up shakeups today were more, a little more unexpected than the defensive side. But um, is there anything else that we, you guys want to talk about before we kind of wrap it up? We talked about Poe, Troy white, uh, Neil being released Uh, again. the, The one point I like about, Releasing him is how that money that in in really cost in commitment to special teams. I, it's not that I want it to go away, but they were taking up several positions yes. with decent contracts to only play special teams. And he was kind of that guy, um, along with like Matikevich, yep. that, you know, they had when they redid his deal. Was it last year or the year before? Last year. Last year. They had come out and said, hey, they want to kind of boost his um, his snaps, kind of using him a little more as that like tight end eraser, kind of that big nickel roll. That never transpired. So <laughs> no. it was nice to see that, hey, okay, it's not working out. We can't afford to pay our special teamers premium money anymore. And so, again, kind of redistributing and tweaking that money just a little bit. Yeah, and I think that's a that's – a- a good place to start. Like for me, like with that secondary aspect is the redistributing of the money, like you talked about, but also the potential opportunity to, you know, Trey is gone. And I guess now the, the veterans in your secondary are Rasul Douglas and Taron Johnson, but you really have an opportunity here, depending on what you do at safety to 
potentially start like a new young core in the secondary yeah. going forward, like with Christian Benford going into year three and emerging as a legitimate CB two this past year. And who I still think has, you know, an upwards trajectory based on what happens with him, based on what happens with the safeties, you have an opportunity again to start this new core where the previous old guard was Trey and Poyer and Hyde and just a tremendous group. Oh, we got to stop because we got super chat. Thank you very much for being here, Carl. Thank you very much for the super chat. Carl says the most confusing move today is at punter. Can you explain the signing of X bill? Matt Hawk is that competition for Sam Martin or will Sam be cut? I, I didn't even see that Matt Hawk got added. Honestly, that was like the least of my worries. Um, <laughs> honestly, I don't know. I, I mean, maybe it's a competition thing. Maybe um, it is. It's because of holding. I, I don't know. Honestly, uh, oh we I'm had the up, I'm pulling up Sam two and a half time. hours. Yeah, please do. Um, but it's not something I dive into all that often. I sure as hell didn't watch any film on that. Punter, punter well, yeah, two and a half hours uh, prior to this show. Um, but it doesn't surprise me. Again, just think about it from Bean's perspective. Like all these moves that he had to make on paper, but then also having to you know, um, reach out to the contract guys, the guys that do the contracts and the yeah. salaries and all the negotiations. Like, this was a, a huge endeavor. All these moves that happened today, a lot of pieces had to come together. A lot of different yes. roles and scouting departments and personnel departments all had to come together to even make a move like this, to be honest. <laughs> Absolutely. And and that's what I was talking, kind of alluding to a bit earlier of, like, how systematic everything was one after the other, like all the ducks that Bean had to get into a row to make that happen mm -hmm. is intense. Um, and then for, for some of the uh, Sam Martin stuff, uh, a pre June 1st release or trade, it's a dead cap hit of 800,000 and you save about 1.3 mil. Um, if he gets released or traded after June 1st, it's a dead cap hit of 400 K this year and next year, but you save about $1.8 million. So maybe it potentially means Sam Martin is out or all jokes aside. Where's that comment? Pete saying Matt Hawk is the bass whisperer. Maybe it's Tyler Bass related, especially with how much he struggled a bit this year yeah. down the stretch. Yeah. Maybe it's a, a, a thing point, for, you know, Hey, we're never going to punt anyway. Okay. And that's, that's the thought we're going back to that. No punt offense, yeah, but go. even if we do Hawk is enough for it, but we need to get Tyler Bass, right. And maybe this is a move towards getting him back on track. Yeah. Uh, um, I mean, do whatever you can to get him back on track. Obviously they invested in him, him too. So they have to do whatever they can control, which is not much when you're talking yeah. special teams. I know everyone wanted to fire the coach, but I don't know if that, is really why Bass would have struggled. Maybe it is the holder, as I said. Maybe it is the holder, but um, it, could, it can be. We I remember we we asked Jay Feely about Feely. it, and mm -hmm. he said that you know a good a, a bad holder can make an All Pro kicker look terrible and be cut. Um, so I've always taken. I don't know anything about kicking. So a former you know Pro Bowl kicker saying that to us, I'm like. Oh, okay. we listen. Yeah, yeah, yeah I guess it's legit. Makes awesome. total sense. Yeah, and the slightest little change in the in the tilt. Yeah, right. of course that makes sense. Yeah, and it the makes snapper, sense. It, it matters. Like all, all that stuff it. matters to them. I can't tell you. I can't break it down, but I believe them. And, <laughs> I believe you know, I trust them. <laughs> not to like open old wounds, but I don't know. Maybe if Matt Hawk is there, maybe it's twenty-seven Bills, twenty-seven Chiefs, and then the Bills are still playing at the end of that divisional game to see if Patrick Mahomes can go down the field. And maybe right. that's kind of what they're looking at. Like they think it's more of an automatic chance at three points. If Hawk is on the field, it's so funny though. Like with all these moves, I did not know that happened. So I saw <laughs> that in the chat and I'm like, what? And I'm even reading it. I was like, that happened. Like just what a day, this, this stupid day. Yeah, it's, it's been rough, but uh, you know, as I said, there, a lot of the issues in, in red that you saw on the roster on the left side there so the defense so um i think now is a good time to kind of pivot to the offense because for me as many moves as they made on the defense the moves uh on the offense especially like the offensive line that really kind of threw me off a little bit um and, and and i'm referring to some of the offensive line changes um i thought that was the biggest shake up when you mm -hmm. release one of our guys mitch morse oh, uh, when you trade away ryan bates and you know you re-signed edwards which was awesome yes you know earlier today we were like oh that's that makes sense the guy was a great extra offensive lineman obviously he knows cromer's techniques hand 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 he knows all that stuff <laughs> but when they brought him back anthony we didn't think it was for a starting role <laughs> no i and especially with 
getting rid of Bates, my I assume two things. I was like, oh, maybe this increases the odds that Edwards is coming back. Mm-hmm. Plus, we also, you know, wink, wink, nudge, nudge. Some of our insiders kind of knew that was already potentially coming down the pike. So if you are a cover one insider, you kind of already knew what was up with that. Um, so I was thinking, okay, this means that Edwards move is going to happen. But then I also really was like, I even tweeted a joke about it yesterday. Like I, I tweeted like Mitch Morse, like waking up today. And it was the the scene from Wolf on Wall Street where Leo's oh, like, yeah. I'm not effing leaving. Yeah, Cause like, I was like, oh, well, Bates is gone. Like there's, there's no shot. Morse is gone. Yeah. And yeah, I just wasn't expecting that to happen. Like, and, and it's not just both him and Bates. Like, it's not just because, you know, we've had them on the show and they're friends of the show, but they're good dudes on and off the field, but they're also good players. Like Ryan Bates was a super sub for what he, he was- could do on the interior arguably the smartest guy we've ever had in the film room. That's fair point. And, and I'm not just talking about what you guys saw in that interview a couple of years oh, man. ago. Offline. I was. was so angry. A little side note. I was so angry because we had about 20 minutes of technique talk with him offline, but I, I was planning on recording it and I never recorded it. And honestly, that was almost even better. Yeah. Than the actual film room we had with him, the interview we ha- he had with we him. We got and I got so lost in the conversation, I forgot to even like record it. And he laughed, and you were like, "Did anybody record that?" We were all like, "No, uh, yeah, no." It was uh, sad to see him go because he's another guy that he had tremendous value. Uh, obviously, the Bears tried bringing Bates in a couple mm-hmm. years ago. Um, he is a starter in the league. I think he can start yes. in multiple positions in the league. Um, being able to play all five positions is incredible, all in itself. Yes, um, and. But last year, Edwards kind of over, you know, overtook the extra offensive lineman mm-hmm. reps, and the Bills used it a bunch, like near the tops in the league. Um, and then they have a guy like Alec Anderson in 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 Q in in training with Cromer, and he showed that he can play not only at guard but also at center. So once they moved Bates along, as you said, it was like okay, you know, everything's settling in. Um, but I I just didn't expect the bringing back Edwards releasing Morris and then the most surprising move about you know aside from just releasing Morris outright was for the Bills to announce that Connor McGovern's going to be transitioning the center yeah. like they didn't have to announce that I'm I'm curious why that was released that's hold on sorry <laughs> it, it oh. just it's that's not something that when you talk about this team when you're talking about McDermott and Bean that's almost I know it's off season um but that's in many ways still giving other teams kind of a competitive advantage for the yes. off season and, and draft and free agency. It's just yes. weird for them to put that out unless it's completely smoke, but I don't think it's smoke because the, the move of putting Edwards in there and bringing Edwards back for competition and then slide saying that you're going to slide McGovern over. That was just weird for them to announce. Yeah. And to go to, go to that, the theme that we always talk about here, like they usually keep things pretty close to the vest for everything. I mean, we, we joked about earlier this off season, how long were we going last off season until they finally like it said that Sean McDermott was going to call plays. It was just kind of like, well, you know, we're kind of, they were just kicking the can down the road, not giving us any confirmation. That's how they like to play anything and everything coming out of one bills drive. And so you had to come right out and say, yeah, these are the moves that we're doing. That's a great point, Eric. Like, cause it, it gives people the opportunity to look at them and think and see like, okay, like what are they going to prioritize? Like if you're sitting there uh, behind them in the draft or, you know, plotting things out, you're thinking like, well, they announced that, like, does that mean they're, they're not going to take this? Can we still get our guy later? Like it kind of messes with boards a little bit. I love the idea if it's smoke, but you know, we'll see. And, you know, Eric, as you queue up um, some of that uh, David Edwards film, like you mentioned, he got a lot of work last year in those six offensive lineman sets. He is a Cromer disciple, you know, from yeah. his time in LA and being here. So we know he's a guy who fits the scheme. It was a move we wanted to see last off season. We were happy when he was brought in and in his limited action um, in 2023, you saw a lot of really positive things and positive moments. And, you know, we both wanted him to come back. We just thought it would be more of a depth piece, but here we are. Yeah, and uh, we're going to dive into some Edwards film here in a second. As you said, extra offensive line fits a a bunch last year. Uh, Friendly contract. He's coming back on a decent contract. Again, kind of moving around some of that that money when you're talking the offensive line. And it's kind of – this was a big shakeup in many ways because this was the healthiest unit overall on this entire team. It was the most consistent unit. It was the best offensive line that the Bills have rolled out there for Josh Allen. Yes, Ever, especially uh, when you consider what they did in pass pro and as yeah. run, run blocking unit, like it wasn't like, well, they're great in pass pro, but they suck against the run. They were good all over. Yeah, they were good all over. I mean, they're a top five 
in several, you know, big advanced metrics when it comes to like offensive line as a whole. Um, yards and, before and, contact, adjusted line yards, like all that kind of stuff that indicate, and it was a, and it was across multiple running backs. Like they were just doing everything really well. Yeah, no doubt, man. And so if you're talking Edwards as a starter, I mean, I went back to some of my notes when they signed him last year, um, because when, when they brought him on, you know, late last year, we we're like, wow, that's a great signing. Like mm-hmm. he legitimately is a starter in the league. And so I went back to some of my notes. I'll read a few of it uh, off here. Um, he's got good balance and he's very good at the combo blocking, uh, especially the techniques that Cromer teaches, obviously, um, good, smooth strides to the next level in the run game does a great job. And and I will say overall, he's probably a better run blocker than pass blocker. Um, Mm -hmm. but again, that comes back to the comfort in Cromer's techniques and what they ask of him as an offensive lineman, uh, in pass pro, very good one-handed puncher, some independent hand usage. Um, a lot of, uh, you know, very good uh, punch and pass uh, versus stunt type looks. And this is what's important to to really think about is Deion Dawkins had his best career as a tackle. And mm-hmm. that was next to Connor McGovern. So taking McGovern, sliding him to center, I get that. Putting Edwards next to Dawkins, how does that affect Dawkins? Because McGovern's a little different type of player. McGovern's very good as we'll get into some of his film here in a minute, especially when we're talking at center, his main trait, his signature trait or skill is his ability to anchor and be mm-hmm. that pivot guy, keep his head on a swivel and help Dawkins out on a lot of those, you know, twists and stunts. I wonder how Edwards will affect Deion Dawkins. Again, the moves on the offensive line, you really just have to trust in Cromer. And I do, we do, yeah. this show does, <laughs> but it's hard to still fathom the moves that were made on that interior offensive line. I had questions coming into the year of, you know, you and I both like the McGovern signing and then the pick of Torrance. And it was like, okay, like how does McGovern actually fit? Can Spencer Brown, you know, be more consistent in his play and stop being a roller coaster? What do you get with Osiris Torrance? And so many things clicked and it is a little shocking. And also for me, a bit disheartening, like to kind of blow up such a strong unit for the bills last year, not across the starting aspect, but also just from the depth perspective as well with Bates. And I think it's a great point. Like McGovern now moving over to center, like what kind of impact do we see in Dion Dawkins and Dion? Yeah. Dion Dawkins play like with the year he had last year. And I, I think the, the warm blanket, you know, of comfort potentially that makes me feel a little better is knowing, you know, Edwards is veteran presence, how well versed he is with the Cromer scheme and the Cromer yeah. system, how good his hand usage is like, and the thing that makes me feel better with all of this, and I, I hate saying it because I feel like it people think it's a cop out, and I guess maybe it even is, but like I in Cromer, we trust. And if this is something yep. that he signed off on, or even if it wasn't, I trust for him to get the most blood out of the stone for them trying to kind of get things back to where they needed to be. But it is definitely a blow for a unit that stayed healthy last year, looked good, built a lot of chemistry, and was really a nice aspect coming back. I listed it on disguise coverage as like one of the most important pieces for 2024 is that you have a really good offensive line and you don't need to worry about that. And you can go from there on the periphery. Now there's some questions on it. Yeah. And, and I do. Okay. If we talk about the benefits of having Edwards in the lineup versus McGovern, especially we're talking guard. I do think Edwards is a better run blocker than McGovern. McGovern is also like Edwards, a very good zone blocker, a zone run blocker. Um, But, I, I do think that he creates more displacement than Connor McGovern does. Mm-hmm. And so I do think when you, when you talk about Torrance and Brown on those combination blocks, moving to the next level and that displacement they can create, mm-hmm. I do think you may see a little more displacement on the left side. We're talking run run game between Dawkins and Edwards because of that technique and how Edwards with his size is able to get up under the pads of guys on those combination blocks and then get to the next level as you see on some of these plays. So let's get into some of the run blocking stuff from last year. Again, primarily as that extra offensive lineman, but in zone schemes on the backside of these runs, those cutoff blocks are incredibly important. Mm -hmm. And it looks like there's some breaking news. Dana says that the bills resigned Trubisky, which was kind of uh, (laughs) um, news coming in uh, to the show, right? Uh, Trubisky is back. Gentleman says, uh, we got him in there already, and it slotted in there as a backup quarterback uh, with Bouchelle there. So we kind of assumed that was going to happen here um, while we were alive, but he's he's slotted in there. Good, good thing to have a uh, backup quarterback. And yeah, you know he he was here, played pretty well as a backup, got a nice little contract from the Steelers. 
didn't play all too well no, there. He did not. Look and good. he's back. He's back. He's like the new Matt Barkley. You know, I like so. the idea of like all these moves happening to open up cap space just to bring back Mitch Trubisky. Like that's what it was all <laughs> leaning towards. Um, great call out with the potential displacement option for Edwards. We talked about it last year when the Bills brought in McGovern. McGovern is more of like a shepherd in the run game as mm-hmm. he as opposed to like a people mover. You get more of that people movement aspect with Edwards. And on this clip, you're talking about like those backside runs like that's hard when you have to reach somebody and cut them off, like, and not allow them to work through. That's a hard aspect to achieve and accomplish in general. This one also, you get that really nice hand action um, yes. from Edwards there when he chopped Herbig's hand down and got inside placement. Like you just see, you really see the Cromer like fundamentals and philosophies reflected in his game, wherever he's playing. Yeah. And here it is, here it is again on the backside of this zone run. I do think that the bills will stick with these zone runs. This is that, uh, hand, 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 chop technique on Cam Hayward at the end of this game. You see the zone run, mid zone. Here's a cutback lane. You see that block by uh, Edwards on Hayward. And then you can see, look, boom, he, he, he's shooting at that freaking uh, Chroma there. Look at that. That's pretty awesome, huh? Um, no, this was a nice play. Uh, again, a nice cutoff block on the backside of this zone run by Edwards so that Johnson could cut it back and get up into the uh, secondary there. He, again, he's very good. Uh, when it comes to run blocking, here's a duo run. So everyone's going to get washed down this way. And he's responsible for Cleo Mack on this play. You see him just take him where he wants to go. Just take him where he wants to go. Fournette gets up the field north and south on that play. Here's another one where he's working with Spencer Brown, something that he did a bunch. You see Spencer Brown work to the play side shoulder of this guy right here. You see he's working to this shoulder. And then here comes that angle drive block by uh, David Edwards right there. He's going to create that displacement and James Cook cuts it back to get into that next level. Yeah, his 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 sense for these zone blocking pieces and kind of understanding his angles, like his positioning. I think that's a really like positive aspect to his game. Like he's 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 not out of position. Like he's where you expect him to be. He's where you need him to be. The way he sets himself up for success in partnering with whoever he's playing next to, wherever he's being used. It's something that you've seen consistently in his game. That's a nice one too. They're just like, again, like washing his man down, like and being in these zone concepts and schemes, like you need to be able to read on the fly what's happening in front of you. That decision to kind of like wash someone down or drive and how you work that with your partner is such an important piece. And that's my guy again, Gilman too. Sorry. That's my guy Gilman making that <laughs> ripping that Lohi ball Gilman. out right there on no, the backside there. <laughs> shout out your boy. Shout out. Yeah. Notre Dame's own Alohi Gilman making that tackle in the alley. Yeah. It's it, that's the, you know, knowing Edwards is familiarity with the system being here for a year, the familiarity with Cromer and knowing how fundamentally sound he plays. And again, all of it on like a, a two year, $6 million contract. So it's affordable. And, you know, you know, he's somebody who understands how to play well. I'm not making this as a joke. Like he knows how to play well with others. He knows what it takes, um, you know, to, to, to function in these systems. That's a good one there too. Like he reads her big cutting inside, washes him down, opens up that backside. Another drive piece here again, getting right up field as you highlighted on that track. And then nice comes off that block and then picks up another man, which allows cook really nice cut from cook too to also read that but look how he gets helps brown pushes that man out comes off picks up the other guy creates a little alley for cook for cook to get forward again that's that aspect of reading that piece on the fly and being able to get to your man and understanding the timing of all of it of how long do i stay on this block when do i come off which is such a fundamental aspect for zone blocking yeah here's another one where you're getting movement And, and i talked about his ability to scoop to the next level right You'll see it on this play once again, right next to Brown. Oh, goes right Eric, up. Eric, to- we got more breaking news. The Bills uh, resigned Taylor Rapp. Wow. Okay, so it looks uh, seven one six. Matt says it's a three year contract. Oh, that's starter money. Three years, fourteen five mil. That's starter money. Oi. That I was not expecting that. If no, that's true, I don't know how much I like that either. I I don't like it for that cost. Let's go. Me, see I don't like it for that cost either. <clears throat> Let's go see. I mean. I will say that is something that we talked about in the Slack channel in our a company DM is, you know, did they bring uh rap in last year to essentially yes. become the starter eventually? Um, it's kind of like it, a handshake option of like, hey, we'll get you in the door at this money at this contract. We're looking to bring you back next year. And he played he played well for what it's worth. But this is granted. It's up to 14.5 million. OK, you know, good but, I, but that's. Oh, I'm, I'm given just what the final numbers. Yeah, given and and that's the other thing we can't overreact about that, right? Because 
Um, first of all, that's just breaking news, and we yes. the details will come out. And given the moves they made and how they're up against the cap, I would be shocked if Bean just gave him that. There's got to be some type of incentivized portion or clause to this contract because the one thing that we did like about Rap when we did the breakdown last year was his ability to um, – his tackling was very good. Now, is he the most um, – fluid smooth moving athlete no but he knows his assignment he obviously got a lot of playing time this year um but he's a sound tackler um we talked about cameron curl and free agency just a, a few minutes ago um being a good tackler especially getting into that alley i do think taylor rap brings some of that and he's got a year in the system yeah and you know that familiarity really nice interception against miami in week 18 which was a nice piece um it just I am a little surprised for the money. Um, and I also wanted, uh, I, I guess too, if you're looking to kind of refill that, I don't mind him depending on the other safety that you put him with. Right. Because I think he is more into like that. He he's better in a box role, the closer to the line of scrimmage, the mm -hmm. better. Um, I like the idea of him being like, I'm not saying he will be, but like the idea of him being like a dime linebacker or an apex time box safety. I think that's where he fits. I think he's okay as a two high safety. I don't think he has the most ideal range in single high looks, but you could do a lot worse than Taylor Rapp. And what's also a really nice piece. Um, he's still probably the best tackler on the entire bills defense again, something that he really brought with him from his time in LA. Yeah, I agree. And, and this is that play you were talking about here and making a Beautiful. play on the ball uh, against the dolphins. Um, and, and we saw, again, he played a little more than I think we both kind of expected. Yes. Um, and I mean, he finished what the year for 45 total tackles, um, only two missed tackles, only two missed tackles Wild. to our credit, 29 solo tackles, 16 assisted, half a sack, um, three pressures, uh, one fumble recovered, one fumble recovered. Um, you mentioned the interception. And then uh, two pass breakups. Let's take a look at those two pass breakups right here. Real and quick. also, too, the, you know, from a playing time aspect, like if Matt Milano doesn't go down, who knows how much time he even sees? Like how much of these three safety looks do we see? Because they really started to happen because they wanted Poyer in that dime linebacker spot once Milano went down, which then put Rap into a safety spot on the field. Yeah, no doubt, man. And it, the injuries on the defensive side were freaking it's crazy, stupid. all things considered. <laughs> so to have a guy like Rap come in and, and put up some of those numbers in limited time, here's another this good nice one. one. I remember this one against, the yeah, end, against right? Kate Otten. Yeah, I like Kate Otten also just as, a, as an aside. He, That's uh, a nice play. Yeah, he's a, he's an athletic tight end there, but that was a, a decent play over the I top. I like dudes who wear no gloves. <laughs> Uh, let's take a look at goodness. some of these tackles here. But yeah, that's, I mean, I didn't see that one coming. Thanks, Bean. <laughs> yeah, right. Another another little action for us. But again, it's, and this is a key point, uh, who, you know, as, as Roy says in the chat, don't get worked up over the 14.5 million. The details haven't been released. You know, we'll see what that 14.5 looks like. Is there a potential out Ooh, after like next play. year or this year? What do the cap hits look like? What's the actual, like, yeah. money that's been committed from a guaranteed standpoint? We'll see. Um but it is interesting, again, Eric, from a schematic perspective, as we were talking about what kind of safeties this team was going to look towards, mm -hmm. at least we know from this perspective what Rap brings on the field schematically. And also, I guess, from a, a known quantity perspective, you know, what you're going to get based on him being in the locker room for a year, him having that Super Bowl pedigree and being involved in a very good team with the Rams. Like, you get a guy who I think helps – stabilize some of the culture pieces or leadership pieces both on and off the field knowing how much of a veteran presence he is and the type of play style he brings yeah and this is one of those plays you see him top of the screen here uh douglas's outside leverage on demario uh, demario douglas as well and and you see him eyeing him he's playing outside leverage the corner is and so he is that that middle of the field defender kind of that rat defender here comes a crosser and you see him on third down come down and, and help make that tackle with taron johnson so that's the type of player he is. Again, he's, he's a solid tackler, man. I think that kind of gets forgot, forgotten yeah. about because of, you know, the athleticism or lack thereof overall. Mm. Um, but I, I do think that in many ways, this was kind of expected. I'm sure Aaron Quinn is in the chat right now saying, you know what, this was kind of the plan when they brought in Taylor Rapp. You could say the same thing about the guy we were talking about and David Edwards along the offensive line and how the Bills brought him on. And, hey, maybe this is one of those, you know, his ability to start is that back pocket or back burner type deal. Mm -hmm. Same with McGovern, the versatility there to play both guard positions, but having started over 900 snaps at center in college, these are little things that when we're talking position flexibility, whether you're in free agency or the draft, this is why it matters. 
Absolutely. And I, I love the point, you know, you alluded to and kind of referencing Aaron, like rap came in last year on a one year, $1.77 million contract after a lot of the safety market dust had kind of settled a little bit. And it seemed very, again, like we talked about kind of handshaky, like come in for a year, we'll see how it goes. And then like kind of not pencil you in, but wink, wink, nudge, nudge coming in next year. And lo and behold, here we are. I do think this signing I think this makes the signing of like, I, I saw his name get flashed a bunch in the chat already. I think this signing lessens the opportunity of Jeremy Chin coming to Buffalo from a positional, again, like the schematic and redundancy perspective. But I think there are things to like with rap. I know some people in the chat are disappointed. I just really like how he played. The closer to the line of scrimmage he is, I really like. I like, how, you know, you showed that, you know, rat look, that robber look, mm -hmm. him coming down. Anything in and around the box and line of scrimmage, I like. But even when he's playing deeper, in two high looks or single high looks, his ability to come forward and fit the run and make tackles coming from depth. He's just a, he's a nice calming presence from a tackling perspective. We talked about it as it, it being one of his calling cards last year when he came over in free agency. This is a defense that for better or for worse has missed tackles a bunch. Taylor Rapp is not that guy. You know, if he's coming from depth, he's bringing the hammer and he's also going to bring it in a way that gets the guy down. He's not out of position. He comes forward with good positioning, good pace. He's also a really good form tackler. He's one of those, you showed it on that previous yeah. tackle against Eckler. He's one of those chest on knee type of dudes and he makes that tackle he twists he wraps no pun intended to bring it down he just form dude forms dudes up buries them and he has enough range to get it done on the back end now i guess we have that conversation of who and what do you pair him with knowing what his skill set is yeah and, and uh you know kind of wrap that up thanks for bringing that into the chat guys obviously we can't chat. um be up on that but uh no it's uh it's <laughs> You can't stay on top of all this. I can't make this stuff up, man. It's crazy. No. Um, but yeah, let's kind of go back to the other side of the ball. David Edwards kind of wrap that up. Then we're going to talk about Connor McGovern. I think again, the run game could benefit. And with Brady calling the plays now with what worked, if they look at what worked last year on offense, it was the run game. I think that yards mm -hmm. before contact per rush is going to still stay up there. They're top five in that department. I think that'll still stay up there. But what I'm excited about is if Brady and this staff look at all of what was positive about the Bills offense last year and they say, hey, putting Josh Allen under center and running that play action mm. game to pair up with that. And of course, hopefully they're going and getting some weapons as far as wide receivers go. I do think that maybe that it can help in that way. Um, we're talking Edwards and even McGovern um, up the middle. Yeah, I like the physical aspect of it, you know, and I think it's also a nice point, too. We, we've talked about Mitch Morse all the time and his strength as one of the best movement centers and guys playing out in space. And McGovern is a step in that direction as well in terms of, like, skill set and play type. Like, McGovern is athletic. He is good on the move in terms of what he can do and getting out in space. So I think there is some some potential like for like there where you're not losing too much, like that loss of – um, Morse is mitigated to a degree, but like you said, I I'm excited for that run game aspect because I do think Edwards gives you the opportunity to potentially create some more displacement, like you said, and I, I say it all the time and everybody always hates me for it. I just want the bills to run the ball more like they did in 2023. Give me these easy six and seven yard gains that force teams out of that too high shell. And if they don't, you pound them for the entire game work the play action game in, create some explosives, the opportunity to create one-on-ones on the outside, the opportunity to go 12 and get Dalton Kincaid worked yeah. in with your play action pieces, all the, Eric, imagine all the beautiful sale concepts you can work out of out of the play action game from 12, like we saw in what week two against the Raiders. There's a lot of potential when you can really start to run the ball successfully like they did last year. And so even though these moves are, you know, again, shocking along the offensive line. I do think the potential losses and changes are mitigated to a degree. Yeah, and and Steve kind of talks about this on the defensive side. Yes, there are holes, and we, we've highlighted it from the beginning of this show for the last hour. He says, not worried about the defense at all. I wouldn't go that far, but I am a little worried. The skeptics will just see how good this coaching staff is in this year. And I agree. What McDermott and that staff did last year was just, it was, it was wonderful. Like, yeah. you can't even put enough... Uh, descriptors on what they did and how uh, they patched things together. Um, and 
a lot of those players that, you know, some of those players that they lost today were not contributing last year. And also Matt Milano wasn't there. So yes. there was a lot of, you know, holes on that defense even before they, these players were released, but you know, a lot of injuries. Uh, and so I do think that the staff did a great job, but my counter to that is there are some changes on the staff. Yes. Stalwarts like John Butler, who, yes. If you talk to any of these defensive backs, he's actually the first name that comes up. Douglas was already shouting him out like yeah. four weeks into his tenure is a bit like immediately like recognize how good Butler was. Yeah, obviously Babbage taken over. So um, you're going to see some of his where he is at practices, where he is in the meeting rooms is going to be a little different. He's going to be worried about different things than just linebacker um, now and, and, and big picture things. And again, the Bills brought in a bunch of other, you know, ancillary coaches on the staff. So I do think that overall this team is in good shape on that side of the ball. When mm -hmm. you're talking schematic stuff and getting the most out of the pieces they have, but they just need to get back to the grocery store to get some of those pieces. And it just started a few minutes ago. Once again, with bringing Taylor Rapp in on a three-year deal, we'll see the details of that contract, but uh, we tried to show a little film of his play and what he brings to the defense. And one thing we didn't mention to kind of wrap that up, his communication, you saw him there, whether Poyer was in the lineup, Mm -hmm. Or was Cam Lewis back there? He knows this defense. Yep. He community he communicated really well uh, on a bunch of those plays prior to the snap and getting people lined up. So I do think that goes a long way, and it kind of hedges their bet with Demar Hamlin. I do think they purposefully scaled back Demar Hamlin prior to him getting hurt. I did think he would be a, a future starter in the league. We don't know where that's at now, but I do think he's going to have a legit shot to get some playing time. Do I want him to start necessarily? No. I do think they're going to address it, but you have in Hamlin and Rap that kind of hedges your bet there at one of the positions. I don't think they're done there, but it's one of those positions. So let's try to turn the page here. Let's go on and stay on the offensive side. Connor McGovern. Yes. All right. Connor McGovern. <laughs> As we start here, then someone else gets signed on defense. Yeah, exactly. We'll be right back on that side of the ball. So the big news, McGovern. Obviously being flipped over to center. We talked about yeah. how that could affect Deion Dawkins, the offensive line, all of the metrics and how well they blocked last year. Um, but he had played center in college, as I said, over 900 snaps at center um, in college at Penn State. Now, he's, he's a little different makeup mm. than Mitch Morrison. This is not a bad thing. And this is where you're going to see the contrast in player. Um, Mitch Morris, tall, athletic, kind of leaner kind of struggled to anchor down when mm -hmm. powerful nose tackles and D tackles mm -hmm. came at him in the past game. Um, but he did have that athleticism on those pin and pulls to get out in the space mm -hmm. and be used in that way. McGovern's not that athletic. Again, he's kind of more less range when we're talking uh, the two players, but he is much thicker from like the legs down. He's like six, five instead of what six, seven, like Morris, mm. but He's a little thicker, and his signature trait is ability to anchor. And I like this because then you're you're maintaining. We always talk about the depth of the pocket, right? The interior mm -hmm. offensive line and the center and two guards are responsible for maintaining the depth of the pocket. You don't want the pocket pushed into Josh Allen's face. You want guys that can anchor, guys like Torrance, guys like McGovern. That'll help Josh Allen keep that line uh, away from him, allow those offensive line to finish near the line of scrimmage to help the depth of the pocket. Anthony, who's responsible for the width of the pocket? Oh, the, the width of the pocket is your tackle spots. Yeah. And, you know, the I, I, I like the idea of McGovern helping with the depth of the, of the pocket, that piece, like that anchor piece. And also just from a size perspective, in case anyone uh, cares, Connor McGovern, six foot five, 318 pounds, whereas Mr. Mitch Morse, it's always wild. His height always surprises me. Six, six. Yeah. 305 pounds so He's a little lighter. bit but yeah a little bit of a different aspect there um but you know for a guy who's 318 can move enough again he's not going to be mitch morris who's one of the best movement centers in, in all the game but you know interested Great to see like, here. how that oh what is this been our so oh, let me go here uh what does the outside run game look like with one guard and one center both not really able to pull effectively oh that is a very good question i don't think it changes anything honestly i think the bills were one of the best tackle pulling teams Mm -hmm. And I think they still will be. I think um, that they're still going to lean into that. Um, and they'll probably even augment it that, you know, a little bit as well, uh, depending again, what they do on Edwards, just because Edwards is back. Doesn't mean he's a starter. We assume he's going to start, but they mm -hmm. did say he's going to compete for the guard position. So mm -hmm. 
Again, Bean, just making more work for us. Now they're going to draft an interior offensive line. What are they going to do there? Like, there's just so many questions. But uh, it's a good question. But the Bills were, they. if you look at some of the advanced metrics, they never, they didn't pull their guards all that often anyways. I don't Mm -hmm. think that changes anything, but they do have two of the better tackles that can pull in Brown and Dawkins. I was going to say, and that goes into like the, you know, the setup here, like the tackles being responsible for the width of the pocket, but they're also responsible like for that outside run game piece when they do get pulled. And that's also, you knowing your personnel, like you have honestly, arguably the best like athletic, like from an athletic perspective, like the most athletic tackle in the league and Spencer Brown, like put him in space, put him on the move. And Dawkins is no slouch either. Like I don't expect that to stop, especially with a guy like Dalton Kincaid, who is fine enough to just knock somebody down a little bit and try and pin. And then you let Brown get out in space. Again, you're not going to have Morse, you know, going out there with you because Connor McGovern's a bit of a different guy inside, but you can still get creative enough and still be effective. Right. So now we're looking at, I think he played 88 snaps in 2022 at center. Uh, thanks to our new producer, Chris Seth, uh, for rounding out those numbers. Uh, that is a little news that we honestly couldn't even break and lead with. Uh, oh God, but yeah, Chris there's Seth, too, many, too much news. <laughs> he's going to be helping us out in the film room with production, pre- and post-production. Um, and he rounded up that McGovern played 88 snaps at center in 2022, primarily in this game against uh, the commander. So at center, number 66, you're going to see him here. And this is what he does really well. Obviously, there, he's uncovered here. So now he's playing that help technique. And you can see how well he vertically sets to stay level with his teammates. And that's important because when these teams want to run some of these twists, he's got to be there to kind of pick it up, you know, keep his head on a swivel and pick it up. He does a good job of vertically setting here, staying level. No one shows, no one shows. Here comes one guy late and he picks him up right there. And so uh, that's what he's really good at. Again, he's kind of got lighter feet and, and he's a little more nimble, but he, he is a better anchor. Um, when it comes to power rushes. And you're going to see a bunch of these snaps where he's you know, using that help technique, kind of that pivot guy, that sheriff in the middle, where when a guy does spike right there inside, he's there to hold the depth of the pocket there. Mm-hmm. And now the pressure from the other side comes and gets Prescott out of the pocket there. But you can see how he can help the interior offensive lineman when you're talking both the guard spots. And you can see just if, like, in in these reps from McGovern getting more movement at center, like, for enough people that have watched the Bills, like, he just moves differently than Mitch Morse. But, again, he's shorter, he's more compact, and he weighs more, which is part of the reason why he's able to anchor. But his awareness is still solid. Like, you see him scanning left to right on these reps where he's uncovered and he's providing that help. That's a really functional aspect that you need at center. Mitch Morris was such a heady player for this bill's offensive line in terms of getting things set, organizing things, and then being that extra support piece and kind of knowing where and what to do at certain times when the, when the assignment necessarily wasn't clear and you get McGovern who kind of, steps up into that area with some experience. And this is a nice rep here. I would say highlight the base. Yeah. Look at the legs. Look at the feet. Part there, of the, yeah. yeah, that flex, that flexion in the uh, from the knee and below. And that's part of that anchoring ability. He's got good hand placement. His hands are right into the chest mm-hmm. of 97. He's got the feet to match. We saw this a little bit um, at guard, you know, this year where he would just get into the chest of somebody and kind of dog walk them left, dog walk them right, stay these there. angles and too, in man. Position. Yes. Like Anthony, look at these angles uh, again as they're setting um, – you know, right to left here, you see him just take that angle. And as that guy, that D tackle spikes inside, he's right there. He's set. And he just, again, anchors down in the middle. He absorbs, of the he absorbs yeah. that force and transfers it and then anchors it so well. Yeah. I just, I, I like the idea. Did I expect it? No, Same. but I can see why they're doing it. And this was Cromer's guy. You know, when, when they went into free agency last year, this was a guy that Cromer kind of like handpicked to play in his scheme because of, things like this you know that we're kind of highlighting here in this mini breakdown once again look snap and he's got two guys right on top of him look how quickly he gets out and then he's able to anchor right there you see that again that flexion just pretty much lift this guy up and take away all that power he had mm-hmm. into him as as he transitioned from speed to power off the snap coming right down the pike you see him just take all that power away from him and just anchor right there and then boom balls out down the field uh to the wide receiver but he drops it there but Um, I I just like what I saw from him. And and as you said, it's not much different when you're talking about how he played last year in the bill scheme. All of those same traits are now just going to be inside. Mm -hmm. And again, I think that can actually help the bills offense when you're talking pass protection, when you're talking, even some of that play action stuff, as I said, because now you're going to have a deeper pocket we would expect uh, for Josh Allen so that he doesn't get stuff pushed into his face, which at times 
versus the Quinnen Williams of the world, mm. the Chris Joneses of the world. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. That kind of happened versus Mitch Morse over the last couple of years. Yeah, Christian Barmore, like those yeah. dudes on the interior. I guess you don't have to worry about uh, Christian Wilkins anymore. Uh, coming, no. you know, gone away from Miami. But yeah, look at that. Uh, the petri dish, as you like yep. to say, there that's created there for Dak Prescott here on the film. Yeah, he, I think this is a move. You lose some athleticism. You lose some ability to play out in space with the opportunity to pull your center. Um, but what you lose in that, you pick up with the ability to secure the depth of the pocket. And yep. I think one thing we've seen from time to time that's been a potential negative for Josh Allen is bailing from the pocket when he doesn't need to. And, you know, I think this is an opportunity to kind of reduce some of that, for lack of a better word, you know, skittishness that we see from time to time. And no quarterback wants to see pressure up in their face. So if you can secure that with Edwards and McGovern and Torrance, and then you have these two athletic bookends controlling the width of the pocket with Spencer Brown and Deion Dawkins. Um, it gives you an opportunity to kind of secure things for Josh Allen. Um, and again, it all starts with that interior, especially with the amount of just, man, the amount of game wrecking interior play that you see in the NFL now with Jeffrey Simmons and Chris Jones and all these guys who can just destroy you by creating, you know, pressure, um, through the interior and the den and destroy the depth of the pocket and drive right. guys back and walk them back into the quarterback. McGovern gives you the opportunity to kind of fight that a little bit more. Just again, just based off of his size and his frame, but then also with his technique, like the more we watch him and talk about him, like last year's episode, breaking him down, like comes in. And I just, I just remember watching him again, just being able to absorb that force mm-hmm. and kind of like take someone's power and like distribute it throughout his body and then bring it back and just stonewall you right there and allow you to not go anywhere. And it's, that's a nice calming piece for a quarterback on the interior um, at center. I do think it's still, again, it's still surprising. It still raises a question, um, but we'll see Eric real quick. We got to bring up this question from Bishop. Yeah. Uh, he gives a super chat. He's been here all night commenting left and right, which we appreciate. <laughs> and then the question here and the super chat. Thank you very much for the super chat, Bishop. Bishop says, Bishop, I think, was also the one who tweeted earlier saying, like, you know, scrambling with all the news that was going on. And then, like, you retweeted it and I retweeted it. Yeah. With, like, yeah. Gifts. Um, Bishop says, are there any players released today that you can see the Bills maybe bringing back after they see the market like what happened to Poyer last year? So, a la Saran Neal. Jordan Poyer, Mitch Morse, um, who, uh, Trey White, I guess I, some mm-hmm. of these, I mean, just from a monetary perspective and then kind of some of the seem like the send off they got sent off with from the bills. Yeah. Like it doesn't make it seem likely. I don't really think anybody is coming no. back. Maybe like, I don't know, maybe like Saran Neal, but still probably like not. I think it would yeah. be, it's a very low probability for me. Yeah, I think, uh, you know, the names that you mentioned, the Morses of the world, um, Poyer, Trey, um, I I think they want to cut, they cut the, you know, emotions and cut the cord. And I think they're going to move beyond that. And and rightfully so, because, again, you got to talk about this roster and how it was aging. It was one of the older teams overall in the league. And so it is now time. It's that phase in this rebuild, in this regime to essentially get younger. I mean, we saw everyone references the chiefs when they did it a couple of years ago and revamping their secondary. This is the, this is the way, and this is what you have to do when you have a contract like Josh Allen, like Patrick Mahomes. I think it's just a necessary step. And uh, again, kind of moving that around restrict, we said it several times, redistributing that money and moving that around and uh, is, is key. And then uh, someone mentioned it earlier in the chat, the draft is going to be huge. The draft is going to be huge because I still don't expect them to make many big free agent signings, especially we're not, we're not talking splashes. Mm-hmm. Um, but I, I do think that the draft is really where they need to make their, Hey, this, this year um, to again, set themselves up for that next phase of Josh Allen's contract. Absolutely. And this is, like you said, it's just that natural step. Like you've seen teams go through it left and right when they commit to that franchise quarterback, it just, it hamstrings you a little bit. Like on the one side, it's very positive because you got the, you know, the trigger man and arguably probably the most important position on the team set and locked in stone. But then you got to go after other pieces and you, you have to get cost controlled talent. And the best way to do that is through the draft. And the good news for the bills is they have a ton of picks. I think what's interesting now too, to potentially talk about is, do they start to take the the quantity of picks that they have and try and turn them into higher quality? Like, do we see Bean move up in a variety of ways? Or 
you know, and I know people have talked about that, but I kind of don't mind the option of just saying, you know what, we've got all these picks, let's use them all because we're trying to set ourselves up for the future and mm-hmm. maintain that cost control talent, especially with how effective they've been on day three um, in the bean regime and getting like a lot of blood from that stone and, you know, getting juice out of that spot in a variety of ways. But it it just puts so much emphasis now, like you said, on this draft. I still expect to see the activity in free agency where, they try to mitigate the needs going into the draft like they always do. So that way they don't go in with just a glaring alarm on a couple mm-hmm. positions. So we're going to get that activity, but man, there's, there's so much fun potential for this draft because of the talent that exists at the position of need and then how many picks they have and knowing how aggressive Brandon Bean has been. Oof, there's a lot of potential like that to happen going forward here. Yeah, Billy was asking, uh, I'll let you answer this. What do you guys think about the restructuring of Rasul rather than extending him after the trade release? So I, he's been an, an extension candidate that I wanted. I like the way he played um, for the bills this past year. Like it was really just a, a great move from Brandon awesome Bean. Move, man. Yeah. Just to get him at the trade deadline. And he effectively was corner one for this team down the stretch. And the thing that bothers me most is he was playing on one leg against Kansas city. Like you could really, you just saw him struggling. Um, I would have liked to see him nice as you queue up uh, a bunch of these clips. Yeah. He balled out in this game against New England. I wanted to see an extension. So I wanted to see a quote unquote restructuring of the contract in a form of the extension. I wanted to reduce his cap hit for 2024 doing that by adding one, maybe two years, but he is into his early thirties. Maybe there was some potential trepidation from being in the crew of not wanting to extend a guy um, at that spot. But I think he provides you a lot of stability. I think it's nice that he restructured again. A lot of times with these restructures, you're taking base salary and you're converting it into signing bonus money and changing some things around. So guys still get paid, but it also helps the team. So it's not like they're doing, you know, complete do goodery, but it's nice to see him uh, giving the team that flexibility. Um, but I, I would have liked to see him re up for another year. Um, especially now with Trey being gone, it would make me feel a little better knowing like, okay, for the next two years, we have Rasul Douglas and Christian Benford. We'll see what Kyrie Elam can become. Yeah. But I think it does give you a little bit of a safety net, at least for 2024. Um, but I would have liked to see him, you know, I would have liked to see an extension as well. Yeah. I mean, uh, my thing is uh, we've talked and kind of alluded to it. What a what a play there, mm-hmm. Ben, the ball out there. Um, he balled out in this game. Mm-hmm. Remember we talked about it. How many, how many breakups should he have had that T. Higgins just like had such Watch tremendous out. hand Amazing. strength? But he played so well in this game. And we talked about how, you know, we're seeing some changes on the defensive staff and obviously the personnel after today. Um, we don't know the direction of their philosophy. It could be changing. And so maybe they don't want to commit to a guy that may not fit more of a man scheme. And, and so maybe that plays into um, the decision here. But here it is right here in slow motion. Check out the punch out oh, from play. Douglas there. Um, but there was no doubt about it. And it's it's really been his M.O since coming into the league, it's always being around the ball, always making plays at that catch point. Mm-hmm. And uh, here's some of the footage from him in green Bay. Um, but I-, I think that is, uh, you know, maybe that plays into it, you know, mm-hmm. one Bean probably doesn't want to commit much money to any positions long-term, uh, even if we're a one or two year deal on, on top of this year, because of how tight they are and kind of wanting to leave those options open, but also that, philo- you know, philosophical change that may happen or could happen. Maybe, they don't know if he can really play in this new scheme that Babbage wants to cook up. Again, we're just uh, trying to think about those other options and things that might might happen on the horizon. Maybe he might not be a long-term fit. We don't know, but mm-hmm. there's no denying that he was a playmaker for the Bills last year. He was a playmaker for the, the Packers for many years, um, and he's loved in that locker room already. He earned yeah. that respect pretty quickly on that um, on that defense and in that secondary. Yeah, I think that's a good point about the scheme fit. Maybe we do see – some switches and maybe they're hoping Kyrie Elam can kind of turn the corner a little bit. And so they really just need 2024 to be like a bridge year from Rasul Douglas or to provide some stability, stability as they get Kyrie back to that spot. Um, this is oh, the question from pops. I know, I, I know. This is on the We're with you front of our mind every yes. week, man. Yeah. Pop says the chances the bills will resign Daquan Jones, Eric, we have our ears to the streets with mm-hmm. this one. Um, it's it's a move that we are clamoring for. Yeah. I think pretty much everyone in the fan base is clamoring for the the fit, the person, the need, all of it. It just ticks every single box, hoping that it's just a matter of time before yeah. the Bills make this move. Yeah, I think uh, I would just say be patient. 
Um, we talked about it at the very top of the show. Be patient. Um, I, I think that as because he plays nose tackle in his age and, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, you know, the scheme fit, mm-hmm. uh, I, I do think that uh, we're going to have to wait a little while to find that out. Um, do I think the Bills uh, – I think the Bills need him more um, than a lot of other positions. I do think he's that important, and you know, up the middle, uh, especially to – again, we talked about Ed Oliver and the linebackers. Um, especially you have Milano coming off his injury. Like they're going to need mm-hmm. that middle solidified so that their undersized linebackers can make plays. And I do think Daquan plays a huge part in that. Mm-hmm. Um, even at his age, um, I do think he's a, he's a big piece there. Roy asks, I would like to see them resign Daquan and get Savage in free agency along with mm-hmm. wide receiver Donovan Peoples Jones or Noah mm-hmm. Brown. So we agree on Noah Brown. We did Absolutely. a free agent episode on him. No, we agree. Jones. Very explosive. Uh, guy, very physical, strong guy, um, and you know one of the like bigger play guys from last year. Now he mm-hmm. played on a hell of an offense. Yes. With we could do a whole film room on just the guys they have at their skill positions. So awesome, um, and we pretty much did with Tank Dell, Nico Collins, and uh, Noah Brown. So and we even Dal- Dalton Schultz, and Dalton Schultz like, too. Yeah, oh. um, we do agree with Noah Brown. I think we uh, disagree with Peoples Jones. Yes, no, I, I don't think he doesn't have much left. Uh, yeah. We like we watched him. Uh, when we were looking, at, especially when I, I know we watched Josh Reynolds, I'm a huge mm-hmm. Josh Reynolds fan. I do think the Bills should go after him, um, but uh, I, I think I'd be out on Peoples Jones, Savage. Again, what are they doing on defense schematically? Are they going to still be that too high safety team, that quarters type team, that you know Tampa cover two type team? If they are, maybe they don't go for a rangy opportunistic safety like savage mm-hmm. right now if they were going to a single high safety look i could see savage with his range and athleticism being a higher commodity mm-hmm. for the bills at that safety position what are your thoughts on that yeah he's one that you know i remember when he came out of maryland and the, his the, his combine testing and pro day and everything was just speed and range and he had a bit of a an up and down end to his career in Green Bay. Like he got benched at, at, at certain points, but ended up getting his starting spot back as the season went on this past year. But I'm in a similar boat. Like I, I, I really want to know what they do at safety mm-hmm. because I think it indicates like that schematic component in terms of like what they are looking for. Like yeah. if they go for another Jordan Poyer type, Taylor Rapp type, something like that. I think like, exactly like you said. Like okay, they're still looking to play like more too high. We'll see that, but. And, you know, someone said in the comments earlier, like with how good rap is, you know, spinning down and coming down from depth, if they do sign more of a rangy post type safety, like, are they looking to play more single high and use more, you know, cover three and, and sky or buzz with Taylor rap, or, you know, rob him, have him be a robber and cover one or use him as that rat or low hole player. Like, do we see more cover one, especially on third downs where we know and NFL teams and even from a college perspective as well, teams like to play this man coverage aspect and they like to squeeze those windows and limit the airspace. Like, do we see more man? And we were thinking maybe it means two man. Maybe we're seeing it more from a single high aspect. Um, right. But Savage definitely ticks that box. When you're looking for somebody with range, with pace, um, and the obviously the ability to kind of play that complimentary piece with Taylor Rapp, if he is that other starter, which obviously it looks like it is, this yeah. was that one I was thinking of that pick against Prescott in the playoffs is the one that immediately came to my mind. Um, that kind of got him back on track a little bit. Yeah, this is, it, this is a guy that again, I think ticks the box when you're looking to add more juice to that safety position. This one was beautiful. Like I saw it in game, he comes down and he reads this like an absolute book. He closes down on the number three from the top. So he's in position right now to close down on number three, but he's reading Dak Prescott's eyes. And that's the reason he comes off of three and jumps the throw to number two. This play is beautiful, Eric. Yeah. And it's uh, one of those plays that kind of shows uh, a DB trusting his eyes, trusting his instincts. Um, that's a Mike McCarthy special, really a double slants right into the middle. Yeah, right. It's perfect. Know, right? Um, but you can see that closing speed, that athleticism, that overall, uh, ability to cover a lot of ground and make plays. Um, I, I do think that he's more of a reactionary type player. He's not he's not the processor of a Gilman where he's going to mm. – Gilman is not as athletic, but he plays really quick from the shoulders up, that game yeah. speed, that play speed. This guy is that twitchy uh, yes. type defender, athletic defender that 
can cover a lot of ground. You see him just fly into the box there. He's just all over the field. So, again, yeah, I could see them looking for a guy like that. Look at that close right there. Um, if they do want to play a little more of those single high looks. And that doesn't just, as you said, doesn't just mean cover one. Uh, it could also mean cover three, and you mm -hmm. just got to have a post safety that is reliable back there, one that trusts his eyes, and not only that, can cover ground sideline to sideline, but also make tackles and solo tackles in a lot of ways um, from space. And we're talking 20 yards, 15, 20 yards down the field. And so um, I do think Savage could help in that department, especially when you compare and contrast his style and play and traits to uh, Taylor Rapp, who they just brought back. Absolutely. And, you know, Savage really, again, like ticks that athleticism box, ran a 4.3640, a 2.5820 yard split, a 1.5610 yard split. All of those just scream burst and juice and explosion. And again, Eric, this kind of goes into that mold. Like we talked about it at multiple points this offseason with Hyde and Poyer, this perennial all pro duo. And great point there in the in the mm -hmm. in the in the comments there. You know, yeah, trust McDermott <laughs> when it comes you. to DBs. Absolutely, absolutely. And you know, Savage or safety like that, it, it gives the Bills the opportunity to just add more juice to that room. Like we talked about, as much as we love Hyde and Poyer, like the miles on the tires started to show a little bit in 2023. And now you get the opportunity to maybe potentially reset that a little bit. I think that other safety that comes in is really not necessarily a tipping point, but could be a very strong indicator in terms of what we expect to see from a coverage standpoint for the Bills this year in terms of tendency and overall usage based on whatever, you know, safety um, that they pair with Taylor Rapp. Yeah, and uh, we had a couple comments about, um, you know, Von Miller taking that pay cut and maybe it's opening up uh, money for the Bills to bring back Floyd. I don't think mm. that is necessarily the case, but what are your thoughts on that? Obviously... He had a hell of a season last year. And if it thank God that Bean brought him in late, uh, because he was a savior in many ways when you're talking the Bills' ability to create pressure and disruption, but also uh create those sacks. He was a great signing late last year. Oh, he was a huge signing for for what he offered, especially considering how long it took Vaughn to kind of work mm -hmm. his way back into somewhat flashy, you know, nature or kind of production or anything. Um, he was a huge force early on. I thought his play dissipated a bit as the season went on. Sure. And I don't, this, this is me just reading tea leaves. He, he seemed towards the end of the year, like he'd get up a bit slower. He'd be like working a knee or shoulder. I don't know how injured he was versus hurt down the stretch. And I don't know how much that impacted his play. I'm not against bringing back somebody who I know is a known quantity off the edge. And I think what's nice about Leonard Floyd, you know, so much of his game was talked about from a pass rush perspective, but he plays the run with force as well. Sure. Like he just, he's, he's a dog up mm -hmm. front, the type of dude you want. I don't like how much the production kind of went away again. Like I said, as the season went on, I'm not against bringing him back if the price is right. Um, but I wouldn't, I don't think I'm bringing him back for the salary that he came last year, which was, I think like a one year, eight mil and one year, 7 million, um, something like that. But the beginning of the year, he was a terror and was arguably the most important player on the defense. When all those injuries went down, Greg Rousseau was playing banged up. Yeah. It was really Floyd and Ed Oliver that kept that defensive line afloat. Right. And he said he's, you know, he's essentially going to chase the money. And I don't think which is Bills... fine. Chase the bag. Bro. Like, yeah. it, 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 That's why he signed in his life. Year. Yes. Right. Yeah, he signed uh, with the Bills last year to get, um, you know, get on that defense and, and to make plays. And he did on a bunch of uh, pass rush reps last year and even some run reps. Um, he had the juice, man. He, and he brought it for a majority of the year uh, last season. So um, while I do think. I like that Vaughn took that pay cut and opened up some money. I don't think it was necessarily to go out and sign this defensive lineman. And I know there were some rumblings on, uh, on, on X and Twitter about, you know, the bill signing an offensive lineman and also signing, uh, possibly signing a defensive lineman. Um, I don't think Floyd would be that guy. I, I don't think it's, uh, I know it's not Shaq Lawson. I know it's, not Daquan Jones. And so there's only a few more guys that they could be bringing back. I don't think it'll be Floyd because again, I do think he's going to get more than the bills want to pay that Ed rusher. And there's a reason why he's probably going to hit the market. And I completely forgot that he basically said it as much that he's going to go yep. and, and chase the bag, which is fine. Dude's got a super bowl ring. You're into that thirties range where you're probably signing one year deals, maybe two year deals, like chase that money while you can, man. Like there, I have no, 
I have no problem with a guy chasing the cash. And again, especially too, like, like we said, like he had a good year. Imagine if he was brought in and if Von Miller showed more flashes of like 2022 Von Miller, like if you're getting more of a rotational Leonard Floyd in the beginning of the year, like maybe he's, he's still showing those flashes down the stretch this past season. Like the, the opportunity that he can provide a defense as like a mercenary off the edge is really fun, especially if you're not relying on him completely. Um, but again, yeah, I think he's going to chase that money. Yeah, and uh, someone says about, uh, and you you echoed the same sentiment, Floyd was great, but having only one sack in your final eight games mm -hmm. is rough. Um, and so, yeah, something happened there, and you, you alluded to it. Maybe it's uh, um, an injury, and you can see the one sack right here uh, against Dallas, and, uh, you know, his, his pressures even kind of went down from there on out too. So that was kind of interesting to see uh, how that unfolded. But um, Jordan Phillips, I think, uh, Pops Mafia brings up Jordan Phillips. Uh. Um, he just I can't don't stay healthy. I, I think isn't he gonna retire? Like I think Yeah, he, I kind of think so. I also we, we don't want to settle back, believe it or not. No. Like we it just didn't work out with him. So I don't know. I don't no. know. <laughs> we haven't heard anything about the Bills bringing back another defensive lineman. Um, I I, I already told you uh who we haven't heard about, you know, possibly coming back, but we'll see. There's there's plenty of time yet um going forward, but um Ooh. yeah and the injuries with jordan phillips yeah i it just it's it's tough man i, I got I one here um yeah. i only watched one game because i had it readily available and i watched it when mm -hmm. he got released but jeffrey in the comments asks uh what about shaq barrett from tampa eric have you watched anything um on shaq barrett who was released from Absolutely. the tampa bay buccaneers last yeah last week i think last like thursday wednesday something like that yeah, um, we did um, a free agent report on him. Let me see if I can find let me it here. Pull that up. I watched. I watched one game. I watched the game against Houston, and there's some reps that are really, really nice. Like uh, him playing the run, um, him walking back, uh, George Fant at right tackle, like violently into C.J. Stroud's lap. I don't think he's the Shaq Barrett that was like that terror off the edge when the Bucks were, you know, those Brady years that are like the the, the Super Bowl type of Buccaneers defense, mm -hmm. but. Offers you that veteran presence, plays the run, plays the pass. Again, yeah. I don't think he's that same dude, but he's still got enough moves. He can still work some speed. He could be a power to get to I don't yes. think he's like a starter. I think he would be kind of along the the lines of, um, you know, Shaq Bear, uh, Leonard Floyd, yep. um, like the Bills did last year. So here are some of my notes. Um, I think right now at this point, he has average athleticism in space. He did drop into coverage a little bit. Uh, aging defender. Yeah. You can see him getting a little thicker through the midsection. Yep. Um, can be driven off the line of scrimmage because of his inability to anchor. Works down the line of scrimmage on the backside of runs. So that run and chase down the line of scrimmage, mm -hmm. he still got that. Um, doesn't quite have the burst that he once had, which, again, no surprise given his age. Um, especially, you know, he's been a really good pass rusher and overall defender um, over the years when you're talking um, consistency year after year. He's been really good in that department, but he still can jam a tight end at the line of scrimmage, control him, um, and recognize run plays, just dis discard that tight end and make plays. Um, and he's just, he's savvy, man. So he knows how to win. He knows how to create short edges. Mm -hmm. He knows how to change up his speed and pacing to the rushers so that he can get that, you know, just that slightest opening and then just, you know, pry down the edge there. He's still got some pass rush skills. I wouldn't want him as a starter, but, you know, hedging him with Vaughn, now that's a good idea. And having him as a pass rush specialist, I, I like the idea. Again, it's going to come down to cost. Yeah, the cost is going to be the hugest piece and, and most important part. And yeah, there were there were some flat. Again, I only watched one game, so that's a small sample size um, for me. But in and again, the Texans, Laramie Tunso on the left side and then Fant on the right, who's not bad. But just a lot of that game, Barrett was really getting stonewalled on the outside. And again, he had a couple reps where he's going speed to power or he beat Tunsil around the edge with a nice chop rip and then got a strip sack um, on CJ Stroud. But you just didn't see, I think enough for me to like warrant the potential contract that you think he might get. But if he wants to come here on like a one year, $5 million deal, like I'm, I'm with it. Yeah, no doubt. And so here's some of his film. Again, he still got that ability to, to challenge edge. You see the cross chop there against, uh, the Eagles that leads to an interception. So he can still get after it. Um, and that change of direction is still there. He's uh, again, getting inside, creating you that nailed it on him being a little thicker in the midsection. Yeah. Like can, his body type has changed a little bit. You can see it. But again, when you play this, and this is why I do think guys like Vaughn can still be productive as pass rushers. 
um, because you don't lose that skill in that football IQ and mm-hmm. how to win edges, how to beat a guy one on one, how to recognize protections and know what edge to attack, how to attack what hand. Like those, that all that, those reps and that those scars and mm-hmm. and and all that experience goes a long way from a pass rushing perspective. I don't think Vaughn's just going to all of a sudden not know how to win, even if his burst isn't quite what it was. He mm-hmm. still knows how to set up tackles and change pass rush moves, change the speed to show the illusion of speed up the field and then cut back inside. Guys like Shaq Barrett, Von Miller, those type of guys, even as they age, they usually tend to age very well because they know how to win against protections and they know how to win against the man in front of them. There's so much importance at at the pass rush position that isn't just athleticism or juice or youth. Like it is knowing how to rush that pass rush plan, that ability to attack and know what moves to throw and when to throw them. And I think that was one of the encouraging things that I saw with Shaq in that game against Houston. That I watched is the first couple drives. You saw him kind of set things up and he was, you know, testing the inside a little bit, kind of testing the cage. And then he gets that one rep that you show where he just completely goes through the right tackles chest. And when he does that, he feigns a long arm and then drops in, goes speed to power and goes right. right through him. And he was setting that up for like the first three drives. And that's such an important thing. Like you, these dudes, they're similar to pitchers who, yeah, like they don't have their 99 mile an hour fastball anymore, but they know how to locate. They know how to change up what they're throwing. They know how to throw their fastball and their change up from the same arm angle with the same motion. So you can't get a read on it. You don't know which pitch is coming. And that's an important aspect. Like that's, that's the type of thing where you wish you could take that veteran savvy and that mind and put it in like the 24 year old rookie's body that has all the juice and the athleticism still. Mm -hmm. Um, but you know, I think there is something to offer there, but again, it's like everything we've done this entire off season with free agent wish lists. It's all like, what's the cost? What's the cost? What's the cost? Are they yeah. cheap? Yes. Awesome. Are they a little expensive? Are they cool? Probably not. Yeah. And as we started the show, you know, there's a lot of curveballs thrown our way prior to this show, but also it, the, being just through a monkey wrench in our entire plan when it came sure. to this off season, because we talked about it for weeks now, how we've done, when we're talking you know, the draft, we've done so much homework on the skill positions, the wide receivers of this class. And now it's like, <laughs> there's a lot of more, there's a lot more openings now where now we got a lot more studying to do on the defensive side, no doubt. Um, you know, on top of not just interior defensive line, which has obviously been need, but now outside at edge in the secondary, there's a lot more, as we said, red corner uh, becomes like an option yeah. now on corner, day three. I know, like I know, maybe they double, crazy. maybe they double dip at safety. Um, it's just, yeah, so many more possibilities because of the holes that have been created from a starting perspective and from a depth of perspective, which I'm kind of like excited for a little bit, but I'm also kind of pissed off. I know. <laughs> I know. <laughs> Cause I, I didn't, I don't think I studied one corner. I don't think, I watched aside some, from the senior bowl, like watching those yes. guys and stuff, like some of those names. I've done but. a little, like the ones I've really done, like I've watched some stuff on Nate Wiggins from Clemson. And then I've watched like Rake Straw and um, Chris Abrams drain from Missouri. But that was really because I was watching for Darius Robinson. Then they right. flash and I'd stay yeah. on that tape and watch them play. So I was watching them by extension. But yeah, I haven't really like dug in. I can maybe, I can maybe speak to like four corners in this class, <laughs> if anything. And now I'm also like, I'm deep into safety. Like I can speak to like, yeah, yeah. probably like nine, 10, 11 yep. safeties. But now I'm like, okay, I'm gonna, probably going to push it to like 15 to 20. Cause maybe, especially if they go more single high stuff, maybe they look towards a Malik Mustafa in the mm-hmm. fifth round or the sixth round. Now, even if they do take cam kitchens in round two or one or three or whatever, like just a lot of man, like wonkiness now does just, Oh, it's just so frustrating. It's fun and it's awesome, but man, just we wild. A couple comments about bringing Cam Lewis back, bringing in Dan Jackson. I, I think those guys will, they'll be there. I don't think that mm-hmm. they're going to probably sign with anyone else. I like Cam Lewis's versatility, safety, uh, boundary corner, slot corner. Mm-hmm. It'd be nice to have that flexibility back there. Mm-hmm. Dane Jackson, I mean, we're never going to, um, basically Dane Jackson has become what Greg Thompson calls the roster cockroach, right? Like he just, he just such a good fit for this scheme. They love his demeanor. They love his poise. 
Um, I could definitely see them, you know, eventually bringing him back to K says, uh, Bean wanted you two to be busy. Yeah. There's no doubt about it. Thanks Bean. Yeah. yeah thanks yeah. a lot, bud. <laughs> this has been like three out of the last four weeks. Like something happens on, and they, they've been little like coaching changes or little tweaks. And we're like, okay, cool. Let's add this in. Let's do this, man. Like, yeah, today was just an absolute wild day, but it's also fun. Like there's, this is going to be a different bills roster. Mm-hmm. In 2023, in 2024, like the group that we have seen that's kind of shepherded this team out of the drought and into perennial AFC, you know, East contention and AFC conference contention, it's starting to change a little bit. No more Trey White, no more Jordan Poyer, no more Micah Hyde. We'll see, you know, Daquan Jones only been here a couple years. We'll see what happens with Daquan Jones. And then on the offensive side, like Morse has been a stalwart really for the last like several years. Like he's gone now. He started to infuse new offensive line pieces last year. Like it's it, the, the face of this team schematically, but also on the surface is starting to change a little bit. And that's exciting, but it's also potentially scary because a lot of these guys that they're losing were core reasons why this team turned the corner and became the team and the franchise that it was because of who they were on and off the field. And it's going to take a lot to replace them. The good news is they have the draft capital to do it and they have some more financial flexibility now, but man, this, and that's why we say like it created so much more work for us now, because now we have to start Eric looking under stones that we potentially weren't going to look under before because of the new holes and spots that have been opened up on this team. Yeah, no doubt about it, man. Yeah, send your guys' final questions in. Uh, we appreciate everyone joining in. It's been a great turnout tonight. Mm -hmm. The chat has been off the hook. Um, obviously, Greg and Aaron are coming up here in about 20 minutes, covering one Buffalo. Um, if you want your financial details on all these moves, I, I, I assume Greg has it all squared away from you. Yeah, I didn't want guys. to steal... I know you're not a big math guy, and I didn't I want to steal too much yeah. of Greg's thunder, so I gave little bits and tidbits, but yeah, I didn't want to uh, drag it down too much knowing that he'll probably Yeah, it, it, like I said at the top, I'm like, you know what? We're going to bridge the the gap when it comes to schematics, what it means on the field. A lot of it, we did some film uh, breakdowns of David Edwards, um, obviously also kind of McGovern with the the rumor and, and that he's going to ship to center. <laughs> we had watched some of that film. Uh, we had some awesome free agency questions, guys that – um, now they could be even targeting even more and maybe mm -hmm. even higher up on the list um, and some new guys that we uh, we can start to target now as well. So um, before we get out of here, um, one, thank you for joining us live. And two, send us your questions on top of, as Troy said, punching that like button. Leave us a comment in the video afterwards. Um, and because we couldn't do any of this without you guys, all of the telestration of the, the, you know, the stats and the memberships we have, PFF, Sports Info Solutions. Um, pro football uh, reference, all those websites that we have to bring you this, uh, you know, type of show, especially when you're talking a show that we had to pivot to two and a half hours before, um, you know, this entire, uh, the show, uh, it was a hectic day. Thank oh. you, Bean. We appreciate it. But if it wasn't for all those moves for our team, the bills, um, you guys wouldn't be here with us, you know, yes. 400 strong right now. So we do appreciate it. Uh, you know, obviously right now and going forward. Absolutely. It, it makes everything we do uh, worth it and, you know, makes the, the chaos and the scramble, uh, you know, more palatable. Um, I'm also proud of myself. You know, I'm sick. I only coughed once during the show. It was a little ill-timed, um, <laughs> but I only coughed once. And, you know, the Theraflu for me is starting to wear off a little bit. But I really thought like, so I had my show last night. I did mm -hmm. Joe's show before I went live for Disguise yeah. Coverage. The Theraflu started to wear. I felt it at 10.05. The Theraflu was, <laughs> was gone from me. My head was pounding, but I got through it. And I was like, you know what? Wednesday's going to be good. The prep is basically done. I'm going to watch a little more film today just to put some final notes together. Yeah. Out the window. And we're scrambling at the end. But yeah, everything really came together tremendously in this one. And preview like, next week's show, too. A preview yes. next week's show. Let, let everyone know what we're going to be talking about. What we were supposed to do tonight. Yes and prep for like two weeks Bro. um it's gonna be a fun show and it's something that kind of goes against what we normally do because i don't know i'll speak for myself i have always been trained to not use comps mm -hmm. not compare a draft prospect to an nfl player mm -hmm. mainly because you know when you're scouting when you're doing evaluation you're trying to paint a picture and by throwing a comp out there that immediately bottles in yep. the framing point, the frame of reference for the person you're trying to paint that picture for. And so I don't usually use comps, but I know you guys love them, especially for people that can't 
tune into our lengthy breakdowns mm -hmm. and just want to get an idea about a player. So we're going to do some comps next week, right? And it's, it's been a fun project, but it's been overwhelming at times for how much work we had to put in. Yeah. So we have dove into this wide receiver class and have plucked a good crop of players and are going to be showing you on film on tape who these this you know these wide receivers from this draft class who they comp to in the NFL and we've got some really spot on comps some that you know may seem a little obvious some that are not and it's all from a play style perspective in a variety of ways. How do they separate? How do they win? Yards after the catch ability. Some are size and frame. Some are more play style aspect. Like it's a really fun episode. Again, we've been prepping it for two weeks. It was supposed to be the episode tonight, but we'll end up rolling with it. You hopefully know, we'll next see. week. I will we'll say because next, week, next week's free agency. Next week is free agency, Eric. Yeah. So if, if the hammer drops, then you know what? I also feel like I don't want to jinx it, like because then we'll be like, well, what if? And then Bean will yeah. do nothing, and we'll just be like, oh, okay. And then he'll drop everything on Thursday or something. Yeah. So it might be next week, but if not, it'll be because the Bills made moves that we have to cover in the film room. So we'll have you covered there with the film room uh, next week. But that episode will be dropping. And despite you know the priorities shifting a little bit on this team, we do expect the Buffalo Bills to address this wide receiver uh, position, yeah. especially now. Again, I know. People weren't fans of Deontay Hardy. Gabe Davis, if he's gone, Deontay Hardy's gone. Trent Sherfield is gone. Those are three wide receivers that saw snaps for you this past year that are no longer on this team. The Bills could potentially double dip at wide receiver considering how strong this class is. And one of the things that Eric and I really wanted to show in this episode that we've been putting together with the comps is really kind of dispelling certain narratives and also showing certain aspects and pieces that – players really cling to and how they win. Like you had a great one today. I, I I posted a clip of AD Mitchell and I talked about him being explosive. And then you retweeted it and gave that um, desertion of like explosive meaning like power as opposed right. to like explosive meaning acceleration and burst. And that's such a really good dissection because I think a lot of times people just hear explosive and think it means, Oh, well, this dude's like super fast. That's right. not necessarily what it is. Like, and that's not the type of player that Mitchell is. So we're really going to set you guys straight when it comes to who these wide receivers are skill set wise, play style wise, how they win, what their comps look like in the NFL. Mm -hmm. um, so we're very, very, uh, very excited to do that going forward. And oh, and we got a super chat from Craig. Thank you very much for being here, Craig. Yeah, thanks, Thank you Craig. for the super chat. Craig says, great job as usual, guys. What Vaughn did with this $8 million pay cut cannot be understated. What a nice gift. Bills might not to be, <laughs> Bills might not need to be dumpster diving after all next week. <laughs> That's what we were doing for like two weeks, three weeks, I trying know. to scout all these free agents and, and names that were like in that lower tier, but still really good players. And we did find some gems and, and I still think that Bean will, you know, pull from some of those, but yeah, yes. I, I, this, this move from Vaughn was not expected and no. kudos to him. And it really, you know, for all of the flack he caught last year and the lack of production when, you know, as he's returning from injury, from fans, um, you know, yeah. and, and rightfully so, I get it. Um, for him to essentially bet on himself, you know, that hey, I'm gonna give you this money back up front and we'll kind of convert it to uh more of like incentives mm -hmm. uh, and I'm gonna bet on myself like that. Kudos to him, but let's be honest here. Obviously, the bills aren't gonna move on from him. No. Vaughn's best bet is to do a move like that, is to make a move like that to help this team because. This is his best chance to get another ring and be that, you know, to get that third ring with a different team. So as much as I want to give him kudos, this is a smart move uh, for the Bills, yes, but really for Vaughn to help this team free up some money so that they can really put together and round out this roster to give his, not just the team, but his best shot to, to get another ring. Absolutely. Like he, he knows that, based on the the miles on the tires, the injuries he suffered, his age, like mm -hmm. where he is at his career. This is him kind of not politicking, but playing it ironically, like a little potentially safe for him. And again, Eric, like you said, like, so he was slated to make about 17 million this year. That base goes down to about eight. Um, but with the incentives, he could potentially make up to 20. So if he bets on himself, like you said, and he, he hits, up. he's making three more million dollars than he was going to make this mm -hmm. year. So it could win for him. But at the end of the day, like Craig said, like, yeah, it's, it's, it's a team friendly aspect. Cause even sure. with those incentives, um, even with any underlying motives, which Eric, I, I completely agree with you there, that could be there for Vaughn. 
it, it's not guaranteed. And it's a move no. that helps this Bills team. Um, I also want to grab this quick one from Nikki. Nikki saying, if you bring back a player with a void year, can it be molded into a contract this year? Correct. So if you take someone, if you, if you have someone with a void year and you don't bring them back, then that voided money goes into your salary cap that year. If you sign them to a new contract, it then gets factored in. But again, you could play with it and do different things, but yes, it'll hit you, um, in that aspect and won't disappear. Um, man. A lot of salary cap pieces, a lot of aspects. Um, <laughs> it's only getting started in this offseason. We talked about it leading into February and going through February, and now here we are in March. We've talked about it a bunch, saying how important this offseason would be. And here we are with a red wedding of a Wednesday um, <laughs> in the film room and for this Buffalo Bills team. Yeah, it's uh, it, it, it's really a, a good a good opportunity to set the table as things really get kicked into overdrive next week. And again, for those who don't know, Monday – starts legal tampering, which yeah. means you'll start to see all that news trickling in Monday of who's signing with who, who's doing what. Nothing is official until Wednesday, and that matters because even though most of the things that happen on Monday and Tuesday do end up happening, I'm always remembering when Anthony Barr signed with the New York Jets on Monday and then, like, Wednesday decided he didn't want to do it and nope. ended up going back to Minnesota. Yeah. So they're not official till Wednesday, but Monday starts legal tampering. So based on what happens next week, you will either get that wide receiver comps breakdown episode from us here in the cover one film room. Nice reference from KM Mori saying JD McKissick time. Also yeah, a very nice right. piece there. Um, based on what happens next week, you will get that wide receiver comps episode for us. Or if you get some activity from the Buffalo bills, we will have you covered here in the film room. Yeah. with the with What's and in the channel. Slack channel too, guys. Awesome. Like when I, when we say, you know, being an insider, um, become uh, an insider, uh, the premium content you get, the Slack channel is off the chain. The entire day has been going crazy. Greg's in there nerding out right now, getting answering questions in regards to the salary cap. He's got some weird graphs with a bunch of numbers, Excel <laughs> spreadsheets, and like just seeing the color coding and all the math and formulas. Yeah. Yeah, that's definitely uh, your guys' forte. You can keep that shit. Um, <laughs> um, but yeah, become an insider because you get you get access to us all day, every day. Talk football, talk draft, mock drafts, analytics. We talk everything. We have different channels for everything yes. there. Um, but, but and you would have known that uh, you would have known that David Edwards was going to be mm -hmm. resigned probably since about a week ago. Oh yeah, like oh, yeah. Like yep. yeah. Um, yeah. and information like that just you know flies on by. Little birdies, they like to fly. They're everywhere, and so yeah, um, things like that pop up in the Slack channel. So if you're not an insider, please come support us and everything that we got going on at the Cover One Sports Network. Um, we couldn't do this stuff without you. Absolutely. And, uh, you know, whatever form or fashion your support comes in, we greatly appreciate it here in the film room and on this brand and channel as a whole. So again, to everybody who joined us live tonight, thank you so much for tuning in live the engagement with one another, the engagement with myself and Eric, we greatly, greatly appreciate it. Thank you very much to Carl, to Bishop and to Craig for your super chats. That was awesome to see you throw up that financial aspect to your presence here in the show. If you are still here, which we hope you are, please, please, please. And thank you. Like Eric said, drop a like on this video. Likes are the lifeblood of these streams. Please, please, please. And thank you. If you're watching live now, before you leave, drop a like on this video. If you're watching later, that's cool too. Please drop a like on this video. Regardless, when you're here on YouTube, set notifications for the Cover One Film Room, especially as we go forward. There might be some breaking pieces that we decide to tune up and go live off schedule. There's a lot of aspects that happen with this show, and we are the only show that shows you the hows and the whys behind both the good and the bad for the Buffalo Bills. So turn on notifications for that. If you're listening on the podcasting apps or platforms, please rate and review and subscribe to the film room. And then regardless of where you are, subscribe to the cover one channel as a whole. We have a variety of shows and content for you, whether you like to go in depth, whether you like more entertainment pieces, whatever your flavor of sports content and bills content, we have you covered here at the brand. So give the entire channel a follow and yeah, that'll do it for us here. And on a very eventful Wednesday, on a very eventful um, uh, film room, I like what RJ says here, not just for the thank you, but he says, thank you guys for the awesome show tonight with all the apocalyptic craziness of today. Great way to put it. Uh -huh. That's just, uh -huh. that's just it, man. Today was a day in a good way. My soul. I know, right? I'm so excited to finish here and just go to sleep and <laughs> shut out the world. It has been a day and... I am Anthony Prohaska. That is Eric Turner. We appreciate you folks more than you will possibly know. 
We hope you and your family and friends and loved ones are all doing well and staying safe. Be kind to one another. Take care of one another. If you live in Buffalo, the weather's supposed to turn and be nice again this weekend, so have some fun outside. We'll see if that stays around. But until next Wednesday, 7 p.m. Eastern, where we will either be doing that awesome wide receiver comps episode or some free agency <laughs> analysis, we'll see what happens as we continue to try to balance yeah. the craziness of the apocalypse. Um, I'm Anthony Prohaska. That's Eric Turner. Godspeed. And as always, go Bills.